What's up everybody? Dr. Rossi, strengthsandsneakers.com. So I've received a lot of requests to cover some of these other medications that are commonly prescribed and I want to start today off with talking about venlafaxine specifically and not in the context necessarily of combining it with mirtazapine. So let's talk venlafaxine and some of the in in interesting points about this medication and specifically one thing we're going to cover here is how to stop this medication which is a difficult situation for a lot of patients. So this medication is, as you might expect, a serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor, okay? Now, when we treat depression, and we'll use depression sort of as, as our model here, we think about treatment in a stepwise progression. So a lot of times, if you present to your primary care doctor or you present to a psychiatrist with depression, they're going to start you on a medication, most likely, a, ser a selective serotonin or serotonin reuptake inhibitor. The, so the starting point is going to be just a regular old serotonin reuptake inhibitor. This would be things like escitalopram or Lexapro, citalopram, this could be something like fluoxetine, right? Those kind of medications are usually the starting point. Now if you titrate up on this medication and you don't get enough of a response and you don't get remission of symptoms with this medication, you may, for adult population, you may consider switching to another serotonin reuptake inhibitor medication. So say switching from Lexapro, Lexapro to uh, Prozac, that is one option. But in some cases, we might just forego that step and say, okay, for an adult, we're going to go to a serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor like venlafaxine. So this is sort of a step up from your, in, in your depression treatment algorithm. Now, venlafaxine is approved for a lot of different things, actually. So it's FDA approved for depression, of course, like we would have expected. It's also FDA approved for generalized anxiety disorder. It's FDA approved for social anxiety disorder, panic disorder, separation anxiety disorder. And if you've ever worked in the Veterans Administration or the VA, then you would know that they also use this commonly for PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder. So a lot of different things that this medication could potentially treat. Now the mechanism of action, like I said, is similar to what we've seen in the discussion on Cymbalta or duloxetine. It's very similar. We're going to be blocking the serotonin reuptake pump as well as blocking the norepinephrine reuptake pump. And this has that same effect of increasing dopamine in the prefrontal cortex or in the frontal cortex because again, that dopamine is deactivated or removed by the norepinephrine uh, reuptake pump. So when you block that, you get increased dopamine in the frontal cortex as well. If you want more details on that, I covered it in the Cymbalta video. So the mechanism of action is quite similar. Now the dosing, the dosing is, is a little complicated, kind of weird numbers. So we usually start with 37.5 milligrams of extended release, or we'll start with 50 milligrams of immediate release in two divided doses. So we'll divide that into two doses, or twice daily dosing, for the first week. Now you can increase by 75 milligrams every four days until the desired response is achieved and there's an FDA approved maximum dose of 375 milligrams per day. So that's the top end of this medication. Now this medication is marketed as a serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor. However, what we find with this medication is that often the norepinephrine effect does not start to kick in until you get to doses of 225 milligrams or better. So if a patient's not having a good response on say, you know, 150 milligrams or 100 milligrams, whatever the case is that you're working with, then you want to consider continuing the titration until you reached the, a dose of 225 or better to see whether or not gaining that extra eff efficacy at the higher dose helps with the depression. So you may need to target norepinephrine at higher doses for some patients with this medication. That's one of the challenges. So again, it's marketed as an SNRI. It really doesn't have that effect until you get to higher doses. Now, there is an active metabolite, and this active metabolite is called O-desmethylvenylfaxine. So the liver metabolizes the drug, and then you get this O-desmethylvenylfaxine uh, metabolite which is also active and you can actually follow the plasma levels. So if you do blood draw and you follow the plasma levels, you can see whether or not 
number one, the person's taking the medication regularly, but you can also see whether or not the person's metabolizing the medication rapidly. So in some cases, patients metabolize this medication more rapidly than others, and what you will find is a low level of this metabolite in their, in their plasma. Now, if the level is low, you can consider going to doses above 375 milligrams. Some people have even used what we call in psychiatry heroic doses of 600 milligrams per day of, of this medication. So it can get pretty high depending on the circumstances. Now, I promised I would talk a little bit about stopping this medication because this is a big question and a lot of people have difficulty stopping this medication. So what do you do? What you need to do is you need to do what's called a prolonged taper. It's best if you have a psychiatrist to do this taper with you because it's kind of difficult to achieve on your own or with a primary care doctor. You really need someone with a little bit more of an expert knowledge in how to stop this medication to do it effectively and to do it safely. But with that said, I'll tell you what, what is one of the methods or actually two of the methods you could potentially use to stop this medication that will make the withdrawal symptoms less of a problem. So the starting point, I would say, is you want to switch, if you're on the extended release, to the immediate release tablets. And the reason I'm saying this is because you can crush the immediate release tablets and suspend them in something like juice, say some type of fruit juice, let's say apple juice. And what you're going to do is you're going to suspend those, that medication, those crushed tablets, in 100 milliliters of juice. So you're gonna measure this out. It's a little complicated. It takes a, lot, a little bit of work on the patient's part, for sure. So this can be difficult. So you're gonna suspend those crushed tablets in 100 milliliters of juice, and what you're going to do is you're going to remove one milliliter of juice from that mixture and drink the rest. So you're gonna drink up the crushed tablets suspended in the juice, and you're gonna, and before you do that, you're gonna remove one milliliter. In three to seven days, you're gonna then remove two milliliters and drink the rest, right? So this is a very, very slow taper over time. What you're doing is removing a small amount of this mixture every time you go down. So it'll be three milliliters the next time, four milliliters the next time, right, et cetera, et cetera, all the way down. And this is, th this is a good method for someone who's really prone to those withdrawal symptoms or who's having a difficult, who has tried to um, come off the medication and has, diff has had difficulty or withdrawal symptoms that were significant enough to impair their function. So you're going to want to do this very, very slowly. So that's one method. Another potential way you could stop this medication would be to add a medication first and then start the taper. So the reason we add this medication is because it has the longest half-life of the antidepressant medications. And what a long half-life is going to do for you in this case is it's going to provide you with sustained blood levels over a period of time as you're tapering down. So it's going to help to, again, ward off some of those withdrawal symptoms. So what you do is you add the medication fluoxetine, also known as Prozac, to this medication regimen before tapering the venlafaxine. So you add the fluoxetine in, and then you begin a slow taper of the venal vaccine while keeping the fluoxetine in place. And then after the patient's been tapered off of venal vaccine, you can then taper the fluoxetine off as well. So that's another method, converting to a long-acting or a long half-life medication and then tapering from there. Things to be mindful of. You definitely want to monitor blood pressure before starting the medication and, of course, during the treatment because this medication has been known to increase blood pressure, specifically when we're talking about doses above 225 milligrams. So you can see some of the complications here. Side effects increase as we go with higher doses, but higher doses also provide us more of that norepinephrine effect that may in improve a patient's depression who has not responded to a serotonin-based drug. Now, in the UK, they actually have data indicating that this medication in overdoses is more fatal than serotonin reuptake inhibitors. Now, the data is a little complicated. It's unclear, but in the UK, they've chosen really not to prescribe this medication very often for that reason and also for the reason that it has significant cardiac effects and you want to be mindful in anyone who has hypertension or, or pre-existing cardiovascular disease. So this medication has kind of fallen out of favor in the UK. I'm going to talk about the common side effects, especially ones that are over 10%. So some of those side effects include things like insomnia, sleepiness or sedation during the day, 
dizziness, nausea, decreased appetite, in some cases weight loss, dry mouth, sexual dysfunctions, increased sweating, which I had a great question from somebody about that I answered in one of the, in one of the comment sections, nervousness, increased blood pressure, and then the rare side effects, which are definitely less than 10%, are going to be things like seizure, hyponatremia, which is low sodium, and activation of suicidal ideation in patients under the age of 24. So we're talking about some, some significant side effects, um, but that are very common and kind of seen in many of the other medications we've discussed in the past. Now, of course, like other medications, the antidepressant effects are going to take two to four weeks to occur. If it's not working by six to eight weeks, you want to consider changing this medication. For anxiety, though, this is the one caveat to that point, is that for anxiety disorders, sometimes the symptoms will resolve after eight weeks and even up to six months into the treatment. So for anxiety disorders, you want to keep the patient on the medication a little bit longer to make sure that you're getting the full benefit and to make sure that you're not prematurely switching to another medication or stopping the medication. So I want to wrap this video with a couple of clinical points. The first one being that this medication can be effective for people who have failed treatment with a serotonin reuptake inhibitor. So if they failed treatment with Lexapro, this may be a medication that could help that patient, again, because we're targeting a different neurotransmitter system. It can be combined, as I've talked about in previous videos, to form California rocket fuel, if you combine it with mirtazapine. It's also commonly, commonly combined with bupropion, which is a dopamine or epinephrine reuptake inhibitor that can enhance all three of those neurotransmitters in this case. The XR version or extended release formulation is preferred because it increases tolerability, it reduces side effects, and also can allow for once daily dosing, which is more convenient for most of my patients. It may be effective for other psychiatric disorders, some of those being things like ADHD. There is some evidence to support an ADHD. And it also may have some evidence to support its use in pain syndromes, things like neuropathy and fibromyalgia. Wow, so that's a lot of information about venlafaxine. It's a solid medication, but it is falling out of favor now. I, I prefer to stay away from it if possible and use alternative medications that achieve a similar effect on the norepinephrine system if that's what you're going for. However, it's still widely used, it's widely available, you will come across patients on it on a regular basis. So please drop any comments in the comment section below, any questions you have, anything that I didn't cover in this video that you want to see covered, we'll answer those things below. And please like and subscribe to the channel so we can keep making videos about these medications.